OK, the next item of business is a debate on motion 11496 in the name of Gillian Martin on wildlife management and Muirburn Scotland Bill at stage one. I'd invite members wishing to participate in the debate. Uh, press the request to speak buttons uh, now or as soon as possible. I can advise the chamber there's a little bit of time in hand. Um, and I invite the uh, minister to speak to and move the motion around nine minutes, minister. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to open today's Stage 1 debate on the Wildlife Management and Muirburn Scotland Bill. I thank the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee for its scrutiny of the Bill and everyone who gave evidence at Stage 1. And I want to reassure uh, everyone that I have paid close attention to all of that evidence and the Committee's views and recommendations in their Stage 1 report. This Parliament has a proud record of championing nature wildlife and biodiversity. And so, while we look forward to hearing members' views on how the bill can be improved and strengthened at stage two, I hope that today that we can all agree to support its general principles. I was the convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee in 2020 when the independent Grouse Moor Management Group, led by Professor Werity, presented their report on the environmental impact of Grouse Moor management practices. That report made it clear to me and my then committee colleagues that previous measures this parliament had put in place to address raptor persecution were insufficient and that we needed to consider further regulation of activities traditionally associated with grouse moor management, including muirburn, predator control and the use of medicated grit. Sadly, since the Werity report was published, the issue of raptor persecution has not gone away. Even just last week, I read reports of missing hen harriers. And on Monday, I'm sure everyone in the chamber will have read the same reports that I did, that a satellite tag golden eagle, Merrick, in the south of Scotland, has come to harm, according to Police Scotland. And on Tuesday, a peregrine falcon was found dead in an illegal trap in the Pentlands. I, of course, recognise the important contribution that grouse shooting makes to the rural economy. Grouse moors can be successfully managed in a way that doesn't negatively impact on the environment or biodiversity, and a great many of them are acting responsibly. But we need to end the blight of raptor persecution that takes place on the few estates that give the sector a bad name, and to quote from the Wellity Review, change the culture of grouse moor management. The introduction of a licensing scheme for grouse is a proportionate measure to achieve these aims. It provides us with the means to take effective action against the destructive minority who continue to illegally target birds of prey while allowing law-abiding grouse moors to operate without undue interference. I from yes. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Um, can the Minister uh, give us evidence that the specific incidences that she is talking about are related to grouse moors? Minister. Well, I, in, my, in my response to the committee report, which I, I, Ms Hamilton will have sight of, I have put an appendix in place which actually outlined that, report, uh, uh, you know, that, that detail, detail that I don't ha have time to go through right now. But I would also uh, refer Ms Hamilton to the RSPB's report, which was published last week, which actually outlined that there had been 35 uh, various raptor disappearances since 2017. And they actually identified that quite a lot of the instances of where this has, had happened were on uh, grouse moors, I'm sad to say. The introduction of uh, a licensing scheme for grouse is a proportionate measure. It provides us with the means to take effective action against the destructive minority who continue to illegally target birds of prey and allowing law-abounding grouse moors to operate without undue interference. And I firmly believe that this... Yes. John Mason. I thank the Minister very much for giving way. I wonder if she could clarify, would the licensing scheme be self-financing so that it doesn't, take, doesn't have to be subsidised by the general purse? Minister. So there's a financial uh, resolution that's going to be moved by the Deputy First Minister and Finance Secretary after, uh, after this debate today. There's actually money been allocated this, £500,000 per annum, um, and a lot of that will be Nature Scott actually administering the scheme, but of course there will be a small fee associated with the licence as well. I firmly believe that licensing is in the interest of the grouse moor sector, and I have, uh, to have them regulated in the same way that shooting estates are across mainland Europe. Licences, I firmly believe, 
will be good for the public reputation of those estates, those many estates who hold licence and abide by the licence that have already taken an intervention, including a statutory code of practice that will be developed in conjunction with stakeholders, will allow us to build on the best practice that I know many Grousemere managers are already undertaking. I will move on to Muirburn. Muirburn is a very complex issue and research to date suggests that it can have both beneficial and adverse effects. The provisions in the bill are therefore designed to ensure that Muirburn will always be undertaken with the necessary care and expertise. And I know everyone in this parliament is aware of the essential roles that our peatlands play in capturing carbon and enhance, enhancing biodiversity. That is why this bill includes provisions to strictly limit the making of Muirburn on peatland. But this bill is not just about moorland management. We also have a very strong record in this parliament of promoting the highest standards of animal welfare and legislating to ensure all these standards are upheld. Accordingly, the bill addresses two key recommendations made by the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission to ban the use of glue traps and snares. I believe... I will. Kevin Stewart. Glue have... trap ban. Uh, sorry, I, I think that we can all agree that a glue trap ban is a good thing. But can I ask that the legislation is not aimed at the use of sticky gels, uh, which are designed to deter but not trap large birds such as urban gulls from buildings? Minister. I understand the member's interest in this area as an Aberdonian, having lived in Torrey myself in my younger days. I understand that obviously Aberdeen, uh, Aberdeen City Council have to have uh, measures in place. The sticky gels that Mr uh, Stewart refers to are not covered under this legislation. We're actually talking about the type of glue traps that actually permanently trap uh, uh, rodents or birds um, and, and they will actually die as a result of struggling. The gel that Mr Stewart refers to is the sort that just sort of like makes it uh, uncomfortable for uh, seagulls to nest on roofs. So he has my assurances in that regard. Um, uh, this bill, um, so I believe that Parliament can no longer ignore the weight of evidence that glue traps and snares lead to unacceptable levels of suffering, not just for wild animals, but for domestic animals that can become trapped in them. And I know from the response to our consultations that's very strong support from members of the public for a comprehensive ban. And I know there are members here today who have long been pressing the government to take this step. Indeed, quite a lot of parties actually had this in their manifestos uh, for this parliament. As pre previously indicated to the committee, I also intend by way of amendments laws at stage two to introduce measures to extend the Scottish SPCA's existing powers to aid in the proper detection and prosecution of wildlife crime. But I also acknowledge that some animals can and do cause serious issues if not appropriately controlled and managed, impacting on livelihoods, people's health and well-being. There is therefore a case for the continued use of tra humane traps as part of a responsible approach to pest control and for others to know that these should not be tampered with. I can therefore announce, presiding officer, that I intend to lay amendments to make it an offence to tamper with a trap, so there is absolutely no dubiety that criminal behaviour, whether it ha whatever that happens and by whom, will not be tolerated, particularly when such interference has the potential to cause unnecessary harm to animals. I will do. Edward Mayne. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Minister Gibway. Can you just clarify on the uh, disturbance of traps? Does that include all traps, including uh, live traps, live traps for birds, as well as spring traps uh, that are all considered perfectly legal? Minister, I can give it time back for the intervention. It will be, uh, obviously, I will lay the amendment in stage two, but it is the interference, vandalism, or anything that uh, is, is damaging in a way to any legal traps. And I have to say that the, 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 the conversations that I've had with representatives from the game, gamekeepers were, were fundamental in me coming to this decision. And the distress it, it causes them um, it was palpable in those conversations. I commend them for the testimony that they gave me. The bill is just one of the elements of Scottish Government's ambitious programme to protect and restore our natural environment and improve animal welfare, but it's a, it's a vital element. Taken together, the measures in this bill will strengthen the protections for our wildlife, 
ensure that our grouse moors are managed in a way that enhances biodiversity and the natural environment, improve the reputation of Scottish shooting estates and provide greater protection for our precious peatlands. I have had a long involvement in wildlife and animal health and welfare matters during my time in Parliament, so therefore, presiding officer, I am proud to be leading this bill on behalf of the Scottish Government and to be able to say that I move the motion that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Wildlife Management and Muirburn Scotland Bill. Thank you, Minister. Uh, could I invite uh, members who are uh, intending to participate in the debate um, to ensure their request to speak buttons are indeed pressed? And I call on Finlay Carson to speak, to, uh, speak on behalf of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee. Uh, Mr Carson, around eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As Convener of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee, I am pleased to speak to the Committee's report on the Wildlife Management in Muirburn, Scotland Bill. I thank my committee colleagues for their diligent work in scrutinising the bill and also thank colleagues on the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for the report and helpful conclusions and recommendations and the Finance and Public Administration uh, Committee for responses it sought on the financial memorandum. Over the course of our inquiry, many individuals and organisations have been given evidence in person or in response to our calls for views and I wish to thank each and every one of them for their time and contribution. The Government states this bill is intended to address raptor persecution and ensure that the management of grouse moor and relative, uh, related activities are undertaken in a manner that is environmentally sustainable and animal welfare conscious. The bill contains a number of provisions to ban the use and purchase of glue traps, to introduce licensing schemes to use certain types of wildlife traps for the killing and taking of certain birds on grouse moors, and to make Muirburn, and in particular uh, to limit Muirburn on peatland in only a very limited uh, circumstance. In addition, the Government has confirmed in its uh, intention to amend the Bill at Stage 2 to ban the use of snares and to extend the powers of the Scottish SPCA to investigate wildlife crimes. The Committee notes these intentions, but there were a number of concerns raised by various stakeholders which we reflected in our report. Uh, the Committee agreed to seek greater clarity from the Government in response to these concerns about certain provisions within the Bill. I would like to thank the Minister and our officials for the response to the report which we received yesterday, which picked up on a range of issues raised in our report. Turning to our report and recommendations, Section 1 to 3 create the offences of using and purchasing glue traps. We heard in evidence that there are significant and ongoing concerns regarding the animal welfare implications of the use of glue traps, which can prolong suffering and trap non-target species. The committee agreed, therefore, all members of the public should be banned from using or purchasing glue traps. That said, the committee also heard evidence from pest control professionals that in settings where there is a high risk to public health, such as schools and hospitals, and where quick and effective rodent control is essential, glue traps will still be needed as a last resort method of rodent control. We heard conflicting evidence on whether there are currently available alternatives to glue traps that would serve as an effective solution to rodent problems in these high-risk settings. One witness claimed that the rat population in some Scottish cities is, and I quote, almost at pandemic levels. And so it is important that professionals have access to effective rodent control. The committee explored the option of a licensing scheme to permit the limited use of glue traps. The minister told us this would not be workable as there was no accreditation scheme for pest control professionals, but the industry disagreed, citing the existence of a licensing scheme for gull management. In our response, the minister provided more detailed information about why a licensing scheme would not be workable for the professional pest control industry. The Minister also responded to a request for clarification about the available alternative forms of rodent control that would be appropriate for high-risk settings, with a letter detailing the various rodent control methods she believed would be as effective. Now, turning to the remainder of the Bill, which is the three licensing schemes for use of certain wildlife traps to kill or take red grouse uh, to, uh, and to make a uh, muir burn. There were two overarching issues raised by potential license applicants and their evidence to us, and I will set uh, these out before, uh, in turn uh, before I look at the three schemes in, in more detail. First, there was a concern that raptor persecution in Moorland, given uh, as the rationale for propo the proposed license scheme, is no longer as prevalent in Moorland as it was historically. There was, therefore, a call for any licensing scheme to be proportionate and workable. 
Second was a concern that a licence could be suspended by Nature Scott in circumstances despite there not being satisfied, uh, Nature Scott not being satisfied that a relative uh, offence had been committed. Potential licence holders expressed strong concerns that a minor breach of licence conditions or vexatious complaint could result in the loss of a licence and therefore a loss of income and, worse scenario, a loss of jobs. The Minister and Nature Scott gave reassurances that a licence would, not, it would only be suspended uh, in this way in, uh, in serious circumstances, but in our report we asked what safeguards could be added to the bill to reflect this reassurance. Turning now to each individual licensing scheme, the committee was content with the bill's proposal. I will. John Sweeney. I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Carson for giving me. I wonder if the committee has given any consideration to what role it might perform if, in the event of this legislation passing, that the committee could consider the operation of the licensing arrangements to provide wider and broader satisfaction or issues about how that is operating. Finley Carson. Uh, I, I, I thank the member for, uh, uh, for, for that question. It, it, yes, it was a, a serious consideration. We have seen uh, what, in, in my view, is a failure uh, of the, the work that Nature Scott has done with the, the sector in regards to hunting with dogs. Uh, and we did uh, ask about how the committee could get involved, but there appears to be a limited uh, opportunity for the committee to look at uh, any proposed uh, code of conduct or whatever before it would actually come into practice. There was also concerns about the time from when that code of practice would come into practice when uh, and the licensing scheme actually came into force. So, uh, yeah, we certainly uh, had concerns on that. Um, so the individual licensing schemes, uh, the committee was content with the bill's proposals for a licensing scheme for wildlife traps. And the main issue which came up uh, was the suggestion from stakeholders for the bill to include an offence for wild trap vandalism. Vandalism of wildlife traps is reasonably common and as well as the serious animal welfare risks, it can also prevent uh, legal uh, predation control and incur costs to replace uh, or repair traps. Um, the committee accepts the evidence it heard that trap vandalism would be covered by existing offences and it would be difficult to obtain evidence to secure a conviction. Uh, representatives from the land managers, uh, as well as SSPCA, however, were made uh, that a specific, specific offence of trap vandalism would be recognised uh, and that because of the animal welfare consequences. So I, I do welcome the Minister's commitment to bring forward uh, amendments at stage two to, to create a specific uh, crime. Uh, there were a number of other aspects of the licensing scheme for red grouse shooting which we made recommendations on. First, and in response to strong concerns voiced by the industry, we recommended a longer licensing period than the proposed annual scheme, and I am pleased to note the Minister's agreement to this recommendation. The concern I mentioned earlier relating to the fears that a licence could be suspended by Nature Scott in certain circumstances, but despite it has not been satisfied that a relevant offence had been committed, were most strongly made regarding this licensing scheme. And I note the committee's request for a time limit for licence uh, suspensions uh, may have more relevance given this decision for a longer uh, licensing scheme. Uh, we also note our commitment on behalf of our uh, officials in Nature Scott for consultation and engagement with industry ahead of the related guidance being drawn up. And I think that touches on the, on the point that uh, John Swinney uh, picked up on. Uh, turning to part two of the bill, which would introduce a new licensing scheme for making Muirburn in Scotland and to apply more restrictions on making Muirburn on ground with a peak depth greater than 40 centimetres. The committee recognised that Muirburn has to date been subject to a limited statutory oversight and that the provisions of the bill uh, lead for, uh, from the, the Grouse Muir Management Group's recommendations for increased regulatory uh, control. The committee noted the complex, contested and inconclusive evidence that is currently available about the impact of Muirburn on biodiversity, climate and wildfire. The committee heard evidence that a wide variety of practitioners uh, made uh, Muirburn in a range of contexts and so we urge the government to ensure that any uh, licensing scheme is workable and appropriate for all, particularly for crofters and other smaller practitioners, and that effective adaptive uh, approach is taken for licensing on peatland as the evidence base evolves. And we agree with the proposal for putting the Muirburn Code on a statutory footing to ensure best practice is followed. On the definition of peatland as land with a peat depth greater than 40 centimetres, uh, a change from the current definition of 50 centimetres, the committee notes the government's reasoning of achieving a balance between the views of the range of stakeholders we heard from, uh, bringing the, the manager of peatland under a uh, greater scrutiny. And, and we heard concerns uh, from stakeholders about the practical challenges of measuring peat depth. 
especially over a significant land area. And I welcome the, the Minister's commitment that the guidance uh, on methodology will be published in good time ahead of the licensing scheme coming into force to give clarity to stakeholders. Looking ahead to stage two, the Government informed the Committee about its intention to introduce amendments to the ban on the use of snares and to give additional powers to the SSPCA. Uh, in terms of ban on snaring, trap operators have emphasised that more modern devices uh, called uh, modified cable constraints do not have the same welfare implications and called for the continued use of these to be permitted under uh, licence. The issue became the focus of our evidence session with animal welfare organisations' view that these devices are, in their words, rebranded snares, and practitioners' view that predation control, especially in those areas where shooting is not practical or safe alternative, it would be a significant, uh, a, the impact would be significant without their use. You do uh, need to wind up, Mr Carson. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, before I close, President Officer, uh, we have not touched on, on, on some of the amendments, uh, but I would like to speak to the fact that our report did not include a view on the general principles. As the members will know, this bill contains a number of provisions spanning a wide range of wildlife and land management issues. Given the lack of detail relating to various aspects of the proposal, uh, policy proposals, and especially to the proposal to add significant additional powers uh, for SSPC and snaring, uh, we, uh, which we still haven't seen and we won't see until stage two, I couldn't feel that I could agree to the general principles for a bill which we will actually see no certainty till after stage two. So whilst it's, it's sorry, but President Officer, it's quite an important point. Whilst I support the It should have been made objects, earlier in your contribution, then, Mr. Carson, because you are somewhat over over time. If you could begin to conclude. I, I will. Uh, I, am not, uh, I agree, agree with the, the general principles, but uh, overall, uh, but not how the bill is going to affect these. The committee itself has not taken a view, uh, but we have presented all the arguments and our considered conclusions and recommendations to enable members to reach their own conclusions this afternoon. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Carson. I now call Rachel Hamilton, around seven minutes. Ms. Hamilton. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I firstly um, congratulate the clerks in putting our Stage 1 recommendation report together? I want to begin by explaining the significance of the brooch that I'm wearing. If you can see it, it's very beautiful. Iona McGregor, a talented young artist from Perthshire, designed it and uh, made it for today's debate to represent the diversity of the land uses in Scotland's countryside um, sports, the grouse feathers that represent the protection of rural livelihoods, the heather for biodiversity gain, and tweed for upland sustain sustainability. And today we debate all the um, issues of the bill that have the potential to change everything that the brooch represents. We we all agree that high standards of wildlife welfare should be paramount. We all agree with protecting the environment. The, the Minister has highlighted the dreadful news of the recent disappearance of the Golden Eagle and the death of the Peregrine Falcon, um, which has seen unanimous condemnation across the board. And in the case of the Peregrine, clearly there is no link to a grouse moor management, but it is important that we acknowledge that this is a live investigation and the police must be allowed to investigate and that run its course. Again, we all want to reiterate that we absolutely condemn the persecution of raptors and it's right that the bill tackles this issue, but we must acknowledge that it goes way beyond that objective. Um, by going too far, this bill, I believe, has fallen short. The flagship recommendations of Professor Werity's report was to introduce a licensing scheme on the premises that there was no improvement in the populations of three key species after five years from publication of his review in 2019. However, the government has ploughed on with introducing a licensing scheme without monitoring raptor populations and providing evidence. Yes, of course, very briefly. Uh, Minister. I, would Ms Hamilton reflect on the evidence given by Professor Wellity and those that were involved in that, which actually said that they were um, content with the fact that we were continuing with a licensing scheme? Is there evidence to the committee? Rachel Hamilton, give um, the time In back. my opinion, there has not been enough evidence to suggest that the incidents of raptor pierce persecution are linked specifically to grouse moors. And uh, in, in I could uh, rebut the uh, evidence that the minister provided to the committee, um, where it discussed the minister's response that talks about ranges, 
that are occupied or not occupied by some species of raptor, raptors in Scotland, those non-occupation ranges by raptors in some parts of Scotland does not automatically uh, equal persecution. It could be a predatory aspect. It could be an environmental aspect. It could be other reasons such as food availability, habitat availability, and it is disingenuous to cast aspirations and create a licensing scheme and other parts of this legislation without, the, uh, without a severe lack of evidence. So, um, a recent peer-reviewed study showed that the red-listed Eurasian curlew raised nearly four times more chicks on moorland managed for grouse shooting compared to unmanaged moorland. And in our committee session, Professor Ian Newton said that in evidence to our committee that we have no interest in reducing the area of grouse moors. And he, in, re in reality, I'm resigned to the fact that operating grouse moors uh, will become a licensed activity because it sounds like the Minister wants to plough on with that. But there must be some movement from the Minister if she wants this to be, and I quote, practicable and workable. Yes. Alistair Allen. I, I thank the member for giving way, and, and I, I can certainly assent to what she says that we, we received um, some evidence that some species do thrive in, 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 uh, in grouse moor habitats. But will she accept that as an entirely separate question from the question of whether there are a minority of grouse moors? who do not operate in a way which is uh, tackling raptor persecution. Uh, Alistair Hamilton. Allen will know that we heard evidence suggest that raptor persecution is at a historic low, but we will not tackle illegal persecution of raptors through the lens of this bill, and it goes, this bill goes way beyond the scope of its intention. So, according to gamekeepers, um, we, there are a number of concerns. Licence holders could potentially lose their licence without the need to produce evidence of criminality or wrongdoing, without, in the Bill's term, Nature Scott being satisfied of a relevant offence having been committed. This would expose operators to vexatious claims um, for those who are against country sports, seeking to s disrupt lawful activities through malice. And I'm pleased um, to acknowledge uh, a specific amendment from the government to deal with uh, tampering of traps, and I thank Gillian Martin for that. Um, but concerns have been raised that uh, part of the bill would also be in contravention of the European Convention on Human Rights. And in her closing, we would value the Minister's categorical reassurance that this would not be the case. It would also require operators to renew uh, licences annually, and this is inconsistent with the type of um, investment and long-term decision-making associated with moorland management. The short-sighted provision would harm this vital socio-economic element. In the Minister's response to the committee's report, she addressed concerns about the potential duration of the suspension of a licence, given this is not specified in the legislation. She claims this is because the maximum duration of the Section 16AA licence for taking the birds is one year, and therefore maximum suspension period be no more than one year. Yet a couple of pages later, the Minister agrees with the committee's recommendation to extend the licence period to three to five years. Very briefly, please. It, given, that, given that I have said that I will look at the duration of the licensing, it would follow that, of course, we would be looking at the duration of a suspension. And, and does she appreciate that I am taking time to look at the best uh, duration for the licenses? And I have said that in the committee on various occasions. Rachel Hamilton, I, I appreciate time um, the Minister uh, confirming. Um, her commitment to this because it's very important. At the moment, there are two conflicting statements. The Minister uh, must be clear about her intentions because it will affect the livelihoods of thousands of rural workers. And actually, by having an anti-rural rhetoric um, from members um, on, on the opposite benches, it means that there is a lack of confidence and trust from rural communities. So when political rhetoric takes over precedent, over evidence-based policy, we will get things, things wrong. Um, this was a message that I heard loud and clear from a round table with academics on the Agricultural Bill this morning. We're debating uh, today um, what the academics were saying, which is that they believe that the Scottish Government has abandoned uh, the view of grassroots practitioners, which is dem demonstrating a blatant disregard for evidence and its potential consequences. The bill, like the Scottish Government's approach 
to rural-related matters, I believe, is disproportionate. It's disingenuous. It poses an existential threat to Scotland's rural estates and the very wildlife it aims to protect. And Muirburn is a fine example of this and exemplifies this. I know I'm running out of time. Do I have a little bit of time to make up? I can, I can give you a bit of time. Thank back you very much, presiding officer. Um, I believe that the bill illogically focuses on the underground metric peak depth um, to arbitrarily uh, dictate how professional land managers can conduct overground activity. Um, we know that Muirburn is an essential tool um, which allows land managers to nurture wildlife, to control the fuel load and, and reduce the risk of wildfire. And we heard that made, point made very strongly by the Scottish Fire and Rescue um, groups. Um, I want to close on the, on the, very briefly on the issue of snaring, um, the banning of which is expected to be included in the government's approach uh, to stage two of this bill. I think it's important that we highlight the threat that this, this was opposed to the ability to protect vulnerable and end, endangered species and livestock. Just because other countries are doing it doesn't mean to say um, that they're not suffering from severe declines in population of ground nesting birds. Um, and to, to just conclude, presiding officer, because we've got, to get, got a lot to get through. Other people have got to get a lot to, uh, of stuff in here. But the, this is an example. This is a potential example of unworkable legislation, which has been referenced by the Hunting with Dogs Act, um, where licences continue to be rejected with the lambing season round the corner. The bill is illogical. The bill is disproportionate. The bill will affect livelihoods. The bill ignores rural voices. And the bill goes much wider than its attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I now call Rhoda Grant around six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And before I address the debate, I'd like to just take a moment to put on record our sadness at the passing of Alistair Darling. He was a public servant and served his country and his constituents and he'll be missed by all of us. And I'd like to offer our condolences to Margaret Callum, Anna, and the rest of his family. <laughs> Presiding officer, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our clerks to the committee who helped produce this report, and indeed all those who came and provided evidence that is included in the report. We in the Scottish Labour Party support the general principles of this bill. The legislation draws from the Werity report on grouse moor management, and I, I know this was something that was passionately followed by Claudia Beamish, who was an MSP in this chamber and was um, instrumental in pushing through um, having the, the Werity committee set up and indeed was very pleased to see the report come into fruition. And I'm sure today we'll be glad that, she is, that legislation is now coming forward. And the report was set up, um, the committee was set up due to concerns about raptor persecution. And we're seeing that, as other members have said today already this week, there is more persecution ongoing and that has to be investigated. But I think we also need to put on record that this really bad and appalling practice is by a minority. And they have been warned time and time again that action would be taken if they didn't change their behaviour and their behaviour has not changed and therefore we are forced to legislate in this area. But at the same time as legislating in this area, we need to be very careful to balance legislation against job, jobs and rural economies that are dependent on some of those uh, grouse moors um, for their uh, livelihoods. I also just want to talk about, uh, for a moment about the handling of the bill. It was very difficult to scrutinise a bill that came in different stages with decisions being made after the bill was actually put down and the committee were gathering evidence. So I think it is not a, a good practice when government lay a bill and then start amending it mid-stage one. Um, Clarifying that point, Minister. I'm, I'm very grateful for, for uh, Rhoda Grant uh, allowing me to just state one of the reasons in which we brought in the, the, the snaring consultation uh, around that was because we were asked by stakeholders to, 
to do that because uh, a particular stakeholder wanted us to look at the issue of humane cable restraints. So that we, we undertook to do that to, to give it time for a consultation on that in particular and to, to look at their, their issues that they wanted to, of, us to address in terms of a licensing scheme around that. So I hope that clarifies why that happened in that particular instance. Rudy Grant, I can give you the time back. I, I, ac I accept that, but I would also say that those stakeholders have been calling for those pieces of legislation for a lot longer than this bill came into fruition. Um, so the bill now ensures that grouse moors will be licensed, and I appreciate um, the minister indicating that she um, agrees with the committee that those licences should be for longer than one year. Um, and given that the government can, that the, those licences can be suspended, there is no need to have one year licences. And um, we took evidence from organisations and uh, stakeholders who talked about maybe three to five year licences and possibly even longer if there was the right checks and balances in place um, to make sure that they, couldn't, that they would be reviewed um, reasonably often. Um, obviously, the licences can be suspended if there is bad practice and a raptor persecution happening or any, indeed, any other illegal activity. But we also have to bear in mind that the management of grouse moors does, do ha does also have positive uh, environmental and natural impacts. People talked about curlews, golden plovers, um, bird species that actually um, really um, flourish in grouse um, moors mad managed for grouse. So they, they enjoy the same habitats and that uh, adds to their numbers. So we need to be careful that we don't throw away the good um, with the bad. Turning to Muirburn, the science and knowledge really needs to be improved. And pro Professor Werity himself said, I emphasise that the science base underpinning a lot of moorland management is incredibly fragmented, contested and incomplete. So while we took evidence, we were hearing about things like wildfires. Indeed, we were um, watching what was happening in Canic, where there was a major wildfire. And wildfires are worse where there is a large fuel load. And it almost suggested at some point when we're taking the evidence, it suggested that a, a Muirburn could be an essential part of moorland management. Um, because if we didn't um, deal with a fuel load, then we're going to have more wildfires that actually had a greater environmental impact. And obviously burning on degraded peat um, will call cause carbon release, but we also saw that burning on good quality wet peat, the peat itself remained largely unscathed. So licensing, I believe, will help share that best practice, but the, the code of conduct and change needs to adapt with the science. And we need to have the heart of that, at the heart of uh, the licensing, conserving, restoring the natural environment while also enjoying the land management um, benefits it brings. Many stakeholders talked about peat to depth and how it would be managed, um, because you obviously can't m measure ev every inch um, in detail of the land that you're going to carry out your burn on. So we need to make sure that there is a workable solution to how land is turned, whether it is, deep, it is peatland or um, moorland. And there was also concerns about the expertise, and it was hoped that licensing of Muirburn would make sure that um, practitioners were trained. But it also became clear um, during the Canic Farm that there is a huge amount of expertise um, held by gamekeepers, and the Fire and Rescue Service themselves um, made very clear that they couldn't have brought that fire under control without the help of neighbouring gamekeepers. So we need to make sure that that expertise is protected and indeed disseminated through, um, our, th th through all those who would practice Muirburn. There was also discussion about um, the Muirburn season and how it needs to be adapted to keep up with climate change um, because of earlier nesting of birds because of climate change. So all those regulations need to be keep kept in check, but more importantly, they need to follow the science. Um, presiding officer, you indicated you'd give me some time back. I'm and you have six minutes. I've given you 
quite a bit of time back, okay. more than for the intervention, so you do need to conclude, Ms Grant. <laughs> OK. There are many other things, then, I, I could um, turn to and speak about that are important in the Bill. But just to put on record, we support the general principles of the Bill and look forward to making it more workable at stage two. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Grant. And can I echo your comments about the sad passing of Alistair Darling, as well as the comments early in the day about the passing of our former colleague, Lord James Douglas Hamilton? Um, and with that, I now call Beatrice Wishart, uh, around six minutes. Ms Wishart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> I'm pleased to speak for the Scottish Liberal Democrats today on the Wildlife Management and Muirburn Scotland Bill at Stage 1. And I extend my thanks, like others have done, to the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee colleagues and the convener for the work at stage, on Stage 1, and particular thanks to the clerks for their work behind the scenes and on the Stage 1 report. I'd also like to thank all the individuals and organisations that provided briefings, attended committee evidence sessions and submitted evidence to the committee. Scottish Liberal Democrats are broadly supportive of the Bill. The Scottish Government state the aim is to address raptor persecution by implementing the recommendations of the independent review of grouse moor management. To this end, the Bill introduces a licensing scheme for the land used for shooting of red, red grouse. Most estates are run responsibly, but there's not sufficient evidence that the situation regarding raptor persecution overall has improved since the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act, so action is needed to ensure good practice. Where licence schemes are introduced, they cannot place undue burdens on those who have to apply, but rather must be workable and proportionate to their aims. Scottish Liberal Democrats support licensing as a method to raise standards, but I would ask the Minister for assurance that the licensing schemes in this Bill will be pragmatic and focused on the stated aims. In the Bill as introduced, the licence for grouse shooting is only granted for one year. There was consensus from stakeholders that a longer licence period would be preferable. Scottish land and estates consider a year as inconsistent with the long-term investment and land management associated with moorland management for grouse shooting. Nature Scott stated that a three- to five-year licence would correspond with similar licensing schemes. I therefore welcome the Minister's commitment to amend the Bill to create a longer licence period. Yes? Edward Moon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Member for giving way on that point. Just on the point of licensing and removing licences, if a licence is to be removed, do you think it's important that the estate or the landowner knows how long that licence will be removed for, so that they can ensure that the people who rely on the ground, maybe keepers or farmers, know that there's some security for them in the future? Beatrice Wishart, I can give you the time back. I thank the Member for that question, and I think clarity is, is key to this Bill. Turning now to the other wildlife management aspects in the Bill, I acknowledge the arguments for banning glue traps and snaring on animal welfare grounds. The Minister has concluded that there will be a full ban on the use of snares and will not include a licensing scheme for any purpose, and she indicates that there are more humane alternative methods available. I have reflected on the evidence heard at the Ray Committee meeting on 8 November about humane cable restraints. Those involved in land management indicate that they are a necessary tool in the box where shooting is not possible and express concerns around the future viability of ground nesting birds. Accordingly, I am anxious about the potential impacts of a complete snaring ban on ground nesting birds, although I am reassured that the RSPB do not use snares on their land. But I would ask that the Scottish Government keep this change under tight review, assessing the impact of the ban on ground nesting birds for the long term. I note with concern the evidence received at committee regarding the lack of alternatives to glue traps and the potential impact on the ability of professional pest controllers to respond to rodent problems in high-risk settings such as hospitals and schools. I would draw the Minister's attention to the committee's request for the Scottish Government to provide further information about alternative forms of rodent control appropriate for use in settings where there is enhanced public health risk. I also note the Minister's response to the Committee's point that the suggested two-year transition period be set out on the face of the Bill. While I agree we need to stop using glue traps, due to the concerns raised about lack of alternatives in high-risk settings, I would ask the Scottish Government to consider delaying commencement of this section until credible alternative methods of pest control are available for these situations. The second part of the Bill deals with extending licensing requirements for Muirburn. I am persuaded on the balance of evidence that there is a risk of negative environmental consequence if heather moorland burns out of control. 
but that Muirburn benefits heather moorland and biodiversity and is a vital part of wildlife prevention, something that we must acknowledge in terms of changing weather patterns. The licences scheme for Muirburn must therefore enable its use by trained practitioners. Presiding officer, I regret that there is discord around this bill and similar bills. Countryside stakeholders perceive bills addressing wildlife and land management could create a cumulative, restrictive impact on those working and living in rural communities. But this is not about countryside management versus environmental protection. Rather than one or the other, we must have both for the future successes and viability of our rural areas. I believe it is key that all stakeholders are able to voice their concerns and meaningfully engage with the policy that affects them. I also believe that in terms of the implications for nature and people working and living in rural Scotland, that is essential. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms. Wishart. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, Karen Adam to be followed by Oliver Mundell around six minutes. Ms. Adam. Thank you, President Officer. And before I begin, I wish to commend the Scottish Government for their approach to this bill. The Minister Gillian Martin's engagement with stakeholders throughout this process demonstrates a commitment to creating informed and balanced legislation. It's particularly in a field um, that's as sensitive as animal welfare, and I feel that it has been well navigated. And I know on a personal level how sincere the Minister is in her dedication to the welfare of animals. This type of legislation, intertwining modern environmental needs with traditional practices, is challenging yet vital for Scotland, a nation which is deeply rooted in love and respect for animals. As a long-standing advocate for animal welfare, I welcome the general principles of this bill. It is not merely a set of regulations, it represents Scotland's commitment to safeguarding the lives and well-being of animals, particularly our cherished birds of prey. This bill exemplifies our collective responsibility to protect and preserve the natural world, ensuring that our coexistence with wildlife is harmonious and respectful. The issue of raptor persecution demands urgent attention. The persecution of Scotland's majestic birds of prey are golden eagles, hen harriers and peregrine falcons, despite stringent laws, remains a blight on our environmental record. The alarming findings of the Fielding and Whitfield report, alongside subsequent RSPB data, highlight the urgency of this situation. And as well as protecting wildlife, this bill is a commitment to enhancing biodiversity and strengthening environmental stewardship, particularly in areas associated with driven grouse shooting. The management of grouse moors has been a topic of substan substantial debate, and we heard from witnesses regarding the economic importance of grouse shooting. But it is imperative that it is conducted responsibly and sustainably. Contrary to some opinions, as, and as far as I noted during our evidence sessions, this bill does not seek to condemn this practice, but to evolve it and make it more fitting for a modern and conscientious world. The aim is to ensure that grouse moor management can positively contribute to our biodiversity goals and efforts to mitigate climate change. The prohibition of glue traps is an aspect of this legislation. During discussions with the British Pest Control Association, the potential impact of a ban on glue traps on public health and businesses was highlighted and noted. And while some pest controllers may employ these traps under strict guidelines to minimise suffering, the enforcement and oversight still remain concerning. I acknowledge that some pest controllers employing glue traps have strict policies to mitigate against unnecessary and prolonged suffering, but I, along with many animal rights and veterinary organisations, still have serious and unresolved concerns about the enforcement and oversight of these policies. Instances of non-target species, including birds and domestic pets, being trapped and subjected to agony emphasise the need for outlawing these devices. President Officer, I heard horrific stories of animals chewing off their own limbs to escape the trap. We cannot turn away from such agony, and I wholly welcome the government's plans to outlaw glue traps. Yes, I will. Um, Douglas Lumsden. I, I was just listening to, to Beatrice, Beatrice Wisher earlier talking about the potential of public health issues, especially in places like 
hospitals and schools because there's no real alternative in place. So is that a view that she shares? Or does she have any concerns around hospitals, for example? Karen Adam, we can give you the time of back. Of course, absolutely, and that's why I took the time to meet with the British Pest Control Association away from committee as well, just to get absolute clarity on this. And there are alternatives, and it may cost a little bit more, but that's the issue here. We have to look at a way which we can help prevent um, pest, well, help pest control in these areas, but also do it in a way that um, considers the animal welfare as well. No, I'll make way. Thank you. So, in a similar vein, the government's plan to ban snares has been the subject of extensive discussion, and I wish to bring a personal dimension to this issue. A couple of months ago, my beautiful wee ginger tabby cat, Tabitha, went missing. Over a week passed, and I feared the worst, and I was at the point of rehearsing how I would broach the subject of her possibly never returning with the kids. She had never been missing for that long, and it had been almost two weeks. While out of surgery, my son texted me to say that she had returned and he sent a shocking picture. She was so thin, her bones were protruding and she looked in shock. And he said that she was incredibly thirsty and hungry. The most distressing part of this was that the fur around her neck was missing and it wasn't just bald, it was raw with open sores. My family and I were heartbroken at her state and upon examination, we were told the wounds inflicted upon Tabitha look like those inflicted by snares and that such a trap might explain her absence from home for so long. Presiding officer, I'll never forget the suffering of my animal, but can I stress that my pet is no more valuable or entitled to more compassion than wild animals just because she has a name and a human family? I hope this incident is, illustrates the broader implications of such traps on pets and wildlife. And I'm delighted that this bill sends a clear message that the inhumane treatment of animals by the use of snares is intolerable in Scotland. Alongside these actions, the bill covers also introduces a comprehensive licensing regime for Muirburn. This practice, if unregulated, does pose risks to our delicate peatlands and diverse wildlife populations. And a new licensing system ensures that Muirburn can be conducted in a manner that prioritises environmental sustainability and safety. In conclusion, this bill is testament to Scotland's resolve to protect its natural heritage. It represents our commitment to future generations, ensuring that Scotland is a place where wildlife thrives and our rural practices are in harmony with nature. By endorsing the general principles of this bill, we are taking a significant step towards a Scotland that is an exemplar in wildlife management and environmental stewardship. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adam. Uh, I now call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Kate Forbes. Uh, Oliver Mundell, around six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today we again see an SNP Green government not just turning its back on rural Scotland, but attacking it. Because make no mistake, that's what this bill is, another attack. Dressed up in the cloak of so-called animal welfare without the evidence to back it up. Far from protecting the countryside, this SNP Green government are overseeing its destruction. In the place of positive measures, all we get is ban after ban. It's all quite sad. This bill, once and for all, exposes the new reality. Rather than listening to those who get their hands and their boots dirty, looking after our natural environment, the SNP now take its direction from extremists. And if you don't believe me, you only need to look at the Green Party. It is welcomed into government with open arms. These are the people who claim they want to save the planet, but who champion the wholesale industrialization of our uplands, who seem willfully oblivious to the impact that carting our uplands in Sitka spruce and wind turbines actually has on nature and the habitats that many of our most vulnerable species rely on. I say to them, if you truly cared about raptor persecution, you might start asking why it's okay for them to be taken out by wind turbine blades. These are the people who claim to care about our moorlands, but who want to see them diminished and even abandoned and see no problem in forcing uh, those who do more for biodiversity than almost anyone else out of their jobs and off of the hills. Let's not kid ourselves because this is what this bill risks. 
Grandstanding in this parliament on countryside issues you don't understand has real world consequences. But I guess if you never leave the central belt, you wouldn't know that. But the madness goes beyond that. Even with rats increasingly common in our urban uh, communities, in, in SNP Scotland, concerns about tackling rodent infestations have been ignored. How hard would it have been to agree a rethink on the modest request for pest control from pest control representatives for a glue trap license for professionals, even as a measure of last resort? A similarly heavily handed approach and excessive measures are something peppered throughout the entire bill including vast and unnecessary delegated powers. But they're not the only reason to smell a rat. It's clear there are some really nasty politics at play too. The countryside and people living in it are being used as a political football. Increasingly, our way of life is demonized. False divisions are stoked up. Fragile communities have never felt more abandoned and ignored. 25 years into this new Scottish parliament, Life is worse for many living in rural Scotland, and the very viability of their communities is increasingly coming into question. How can SNP MSPs representing rural communities go along with this? Do they really want more wildfires, rodent infestations, foxes wiping out ground nesting birds? Are gamekeepers and land managers endlessly tied up in bureaucracy uh, and dealing with vexatious reports of wrongdoing? instead of actually managing our landscapes, the landscapes they love and care about. Because that is what this bill means in reality. That is what lots of the evidence points to. No doubt those same colleagues would tell us not to worry and will justify their support for the bill this evening by saying it can be amended later. The problem is you cannot trust this government or this minister. In terms of the government, we've seen recently the reality of how the legislate now license later approach plays out following the recent changes to hunting with dogs. Political considerations put before the practicalities. Animals left to suffer, foxes out of control ahead of lambing season is just not right and not good enough and not what was promised. So how on earth can any weight be placed on the assurances we've been given in relation to this bill? We've also seen during stage one what listening to stakeholders really means for this minister. Rural stakeholders were marched to the top of the hill only to be ignored by the minister when she decided to go ahead and ban the use of snares and cable restraints without any licensing scheme for any purpose. This followed what seemed like a genuine request for a detailed proposal on a licensing scheme. But the game was given away by the minister when she then rejected it just 24 hours after stakeholders gave evidence to this parliament on the need for it. This would seem pretty discourteous and somewhat suggestive of predetermined thinking. However, what is most shocking is an FOI showed that the minister did not undertake any detailed consideration of the evidence put to the committee before making that decision. In conclusion, presiding officer, this bill is just the latest in a long line of betrayals SNP co colleagues will no doubt help nod this bill through at decision time tonight, but we must not allow ourselves to become desensitised to what is happening. Thread by thread, the very fabric of rural Scotland is being unpicked. If we're not careful, it will be lost forever. Our country will be poorer for it. At some point, we have to say no more. Enough has to be enough. I cannot support the general principles of this deeply flawed and unevidenced bill and nor could anyone who claims to stand up for rural Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Kate Forbes to be followed by Colin Smith at uh, around six minutes. Ms Forbes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And of course, I speak as somebody who has been elected by voters in rural Scotland to stand up for them. And this summer, there were two massive wildfires in my constituency at Canich and in Daviot. It was reported at the time that the Canich wildfire might be one of the largest in the UK, and it certainly raged for days. Firefighters, local farm workers, forestry land workers and gamekeepers all turned out in force to combat the fire. Anybody who's seen images and video footage of the fire will be shocked as they see mile after mile of flames spread 
fuelled by the density of bushes, heather and trees above ground that hadn't been tackled in a long time. The impact on the climate was catastrophic. Not only did it burn mile after mile of valuable peat, but it also emitted thousands of tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere. The smoke was reportedly visible from space. It destroyed habitats and our biodiversity. Those fires are more devastating to our flora, our fauna, and our net zero ambitions than any other activities on land. And the committee on which I sit has, has supported the general principles of this bill. But what I want to unpack today is the importance... Yes. Uh, I, I, I should maybe suggest that the member should correct that. The, the committee didn't actually take a position on the general principles. Kate Forbes. I thought, I thought I'd heard uh, Finlay Carson say in his comments that uh, the committee had largely... So I, I apologise. I thought that was a, a quote. I generally support the general principles of the bill, but I also hope that the government is able to respond to people's fears that the bill will reduce the tools available to combat wildfires and to commit to keeping this under constant review and to be willing to reconsider again some of the timescales and the requirements around Muirburn in order to ensure that we have all the tools that we need to respond to wildfires. Because in the weeks immediately after the wildfires I have outlined, I arranged a, a wildfire summit. And the warning from representatives, particularly in the fire service, was stark, that we are likely to see such wildfires growing in intensity and magnitude, and we need every possible tool to control them. In the aftermath of this fire, I spoke to, to several local landowners, many of whom have thriving businesses. They recalled their horror and their fear as the fire crept ever closer, threatening their businesses and their livelihoods. In one situation, a brand new environmental low-carbon business, a state-of-the-art building, was under threat as the fire crept closer. I saw that business only a few weeks later and the ring of charcoal around it, but it was saved. It was saved because local gamekeepers turned up. Many had no personal or professional incentive to help. It wasn't their land or their livelihoods, but they turned up because they care. They care about the land, they care about biodiversity, and they care about their neighbours. Rachel Hamilton. I, was, I attended a meeting um, that Kate Forbes was up, um, at about wildfires, and one of the key aspects was that farmers create fire breaks which actually is integral to protecting the biodiversity and protecting properties, exactly what she's talking about. This bill actually could remove um, the, the, the people doing that. Well, Kate Forbes, I, I was going back. to come on and unpack it, what, what is critical when it comes to this bill, because this bill still allows for Muirburn to take place. And the important point I made earlier is that the government is able to demonstrate that gamekeepers will still have the tools that they need. And gamekeepers are, are, are trained in, in Muirburn. One landowner told me when I met with them that this, despite being sceptical, perhaps, about gamekeepers' practices in the past, they had been left in no doubt at all that it was gamekeepers' unique abilities that had saved them and had saved their business because they had tried all other means of fighting the fire to no avail. And so I think I have taken quite a few and I'm really keen to make three points that I think needs to be um, articulated uh, loud and clear by uh, government. Um, the first is this, that to control fire, we cannot allow the fuel load to build up. We cannot allow trees, bushes and heather to build up in a way that allows wildfires to literally run wild like we saw in Canny, because they are getting ever closer to people's homes and their businesses. There are other approaches, of course, recommended in the bill to reduce the fuel load, like cutting. But, of course, cutting leaves behind brash, which can then dry out and become tinder. So Muirburn may be the only tool available to reduce the fuel load. Secondly, we must allow gamekeepers 
to continue to develop their experience and their expertise of carrying out Muirburn, the very experience and expertise that many Highland communities will increasingly depend on when a wildfire breaks out. And lastly, I get that many people in the Chamber will have varying views on estates and field sports. I'm a long-standing champion of land reform and diverse use of our land. But I also care enormously about land managers because they are integral to rural communities. And indeed, in one community that I visited just a matter of weeks ago, the local primary school is predominantly comprised of estate workers' children. Without them, the school closes. And I do not want to see livelihoods threatened by a reduction in investment um, it, it, when it comes to our rural communities. And so, as I close, I know that this is stage one of the bill, but I want to say on the record, and I know some of them are in the gallery today, that we owe gamekeepers an enormous debt of gratitude, that our homes and businesses in my constituency that would have been burned to the ground had gamekeepers not turned out ha with the experience that they have. And I think that we should work with them rather than against them. And I know that the minister is committed to engaging with them, understanding and ensuring that this legislation and the guidance that follows it, particularly when it comes to licensing, should be cognizant of their views and of their practices in order to ensure that we are all safer with them being able to carry out their professional activities as they should be permitted to do. Thank you. I now call Colin Smith to be followed by Jim Fairley around six minutes. Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. This bill has been a long time coming. It's eight years since reports by RSPB and then Scottish Natural Heritage showed that raptor persecution was often linked to driven grouse moors. It's seven years since this prompted the Scottish Government to commission the Weriti Review. It's four years since that independent review reported to Government with clear recommendations, including the licensing scheme for the shooting of grouse and that all muir burns should be subject to increased legal regulation. And it's three years since the Government responded with a commitment to action. Now, there are many who believe that action does not, go f does not go far enough, that the killing of animals to protect another animal solely for the purpose of then killing that animal for sport, the so-called circle of destruction, as Revive described it, is itself cruel. And I've certainly been on record as saying you cannot license cruelty. But I do recognise this bill is not about restricting grouse shooting. It's primarily a modest proposal to license it, to regulate an inadequately regulated sector, although you'd be forgiven for thinking it was much more given some of the hysterical opposition to these modest proposals. President officer, licensing is not a new thing. It's what Nature Scott do professionally and robustly on a daily basis for a variety of purposes. Law-abiding businesses have nothing to fear from licensing, and frankly, it's remarkable that before now, we've never had a licensing scheme for grouse shooting. But there are ways in which what is very much an unfinished bill can and should be strengthened. I welcome the government's commitment to do so by firstly bringing an amendment at stage two to deliver a comprehensive ban on snares. And I congratulate those such as one kind who have championed this cause for many years. One of the first members debates I brought to this chamber was on banning snares back in 2017. The government opposed it then, and then on the many occasions I raised it, they wasted years defending what is cruel, unnecessary and indiscriminate. Both snares and glue traps cause immeasurable suffering to animals caught in them, and their use cannot be justified. That's why the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission has recommended both are banned. It's why a comprehensive ban has just been introduced in Wales, and it's why a ban exists across much of Europe. Let's get on with it in Scotland, and let's see through those attempts to rebrand snares as human or humane cable restraints and any pretense that who sets a glue trap somehow makes it any less cruel. President officer, we should also strengthen the provisions in the bill in relation to traps, not just licensing them and requiring training, but making it a requirement to provide data on all trapped and killed animals. We should look to expand the traps included in the bill, reviewing all types in Scotland to assess their animal welfare impacts and the reasons for their use. And we should ensure that licences are only granted where there is a robust reason for their use, which I'm sorry is not to help rear grouse for shooting. That's a position that's backed by the public. Independent polling by Diffley Partnership for Revive showed that while there was support for the use of traps for conservation 
and livestock protection. There was no support for its use in enhancing grouse numbers. I have spoken previously on the need to incorporate the international consensus principles for ethical wildlife control into our policies on wildlife management. We could start by using those principles in assessing any licence for the use of traps. President officer, any licensing scheme also needs to be properly resourced. At a time that we are always told when we raise issues in this Parliament there is no money, the Government should be making the licensing scheme in this Bill fully recoverable. Nature has got our experience in running schemes, but the addition of trapping licensing and licensing of grouse moors, as well as the burden of licensing brought in by the Hunting with Dogs Act, will need an expansion of licensing teams. And that should be funded through the scheme itself. I also have a lot of sympathy for the arguments that licensing should be for a longer period than one year, a period that would be burdensome both for applicants and Nature Scott, and maybe a period of up to three years is more realistic with scope for appropriate review and updating in between. President officer, the short time I have, I also want to touch on the issue of Muirburn. Again, the proposals are modest. There are no plans for a ban even on peatland, but again, the bill can be improved. If we are to support the principle of a Muirburn season, RSPB make a powerful case for ending that season on the 15th of March to protect nesting birds, given that several species are breeding earlier than historically due to climate change, with the current suggested 15th of April conclusion of the season overlapping with nesting by eagles, curlew and red gulls. I'll give way Tim Fairley. Uh, thanks very much for giving way on the point. Um, I have some information here about the nesting um, uh, concerns that you're talking about. And golden plover definitely could be nesting by the 15th of April. You could have potentially stone chat nesting by the 15th of April, but they won't be nesting in the areas where Muirburn will be happening. Peregrines could be nesting earlier, but they are far more likely to be in crags where you're not likely to get Muirburn. But the vast majority of the ground nesting birds that we're trying to protect won't properly start nesting down until April the 30th. Colin Smith, I can give you the time back. Thank you, President Officer. And there's also evidence to say that that date of the 15th of April um, for a, a conclusion of the season overlaps with nesting by eagles, by curlew and by red grouse. So there is a discussion to be had about whether that date, given the fact that we know that a lot of birds are nesting earlier because of climate change, is the most appropriate debate. I think RSPB also make a strong case for lowering the depth de definition for peat to 30 centimetres in line with the UK peatland strategy uh, and, and the, the, the code. President officer, there are many issues I haven't had time to touch on, and I do look forward to contributing to discussions at stage two and stage three to hopefully, I think, improve a bill that still requires a lot of work. But I also look forward to supporting the principles of the bill at decision time, because, President officer, this bill does at long last provide a tangible deterrent to the ongoing problem of raptor persecution. It won't solve it, but it does. The uh, member is uh, winding up, I'm afraid. Okay, I would love to give way to Mr. Carson. I'm sure it would be a supportive comment, but I do think that I do think. Point of order, Finlay Carson. Uh, point of order. I, I wonder whether I could take this opportunity to, to invite. Uh, Mr Smith to, to refer to his register of interest as a member of the League Against Cruel Sports. That is not a point of order, Mr Carson. It is up to members themselves to indicate any um, uh, interest that they, they need to declare. Mr Smith, if you could conclude, please. I am perfectly aware of the rules around voluntary interest, and maybe Mr Carson wants to go and read those rules himself when he actually makes comments like this. But in conclusion, presiding officer, I think this bill will provide accountability when it comes to land management practices such as Muirburn and Trapping. It will help us begin to tackle the problem of raptor persecution, and it will take a small step in the giant leap that we still need to make in improving animal welfare. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Tim Fairley to be followed by Ariane Bird, just around six minutes. Mr Fairley. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, President Officer, this bill is the latest iteration in response to the completely heinous and unacceptable practice of raptor persecution in Scotland's countryside. Now, it has undoubtedly grown in scope since the Verity Report, but that is no bad thing, as long as we get the balance right in protecting wildlife, helping to tackle climate change, creating biodiversity and meeting the needs of those hard-working men and women who are the bedrock of our rural population. 
the farmers, the shepherds, the cattlemen, the tractormen, the keepers, the estate workers, and all the associated downstream sector workers. And it is in that spirit, President Officer, that I am recognising those rural workers. I, I am delighted to wear this handcrafted piece from my constituent, Iona McGregor, who was previously mentioned by um, Rachel Hamilton, who lives in the Logie Ammon Hills, the very same glen that I farmed before I came into this place. And it is support of all those workers that I am proud to wear this today. Because they are an essential component of our rural population, helping to keep local schools, pubs, shops, garages, and in winter, rural roads open. They are also the fourth emergency service, as my colleague Kate Forbes has just alluded to. And depopulation in our rural communities is something that we should not only be discouraging, but actively seeking to reverse. Now, there is no doubt areas of this bill are going to be contentious, and the stage two debate will undoubtedly be an exercise in negotiation and compromise, which I would encourage everyone in this chamber to have, because those negotiations and compromises will be with the people who are sitting in the gallery. But I very much welcome the Minister's plan to bring an amendment to end to the trap tampering um, legislation that we talked about earlier on. Now, I will be supporting the general principles of the bill without hesitation, and I look forward to stage two sessions in order to shape a bill so that it works in the spirit of what the bill is set out to do. And given the function of this bill and the general acceptance of the almost entire population of this country, that climate change and biodiversity loss is not only a matter, is not only a serious matter, but is in fact it's essential to manage. It's sometimes very interesting to hear, though, some of the outcry from people when they realise that what that means is that actions in their area are needed to tackle the issues. And all of a sudden, the enthusiasm and the agreement that we need to get something done suddenly changes. And usually to the point where, yes, we need to agree to do something, but just not here. With that in mind, I am very heartened with the conversations with almost to a person, the farmers, land managers and keepers, who not only accept the challenges we face in climate change and biodiversity loss, but they are looking to actively play their part in reversing the decline and delivering for nature, delivering for the climate and, as importantly, delivering for the rural communities whose very existence relies on a viable, healthy, working rural environment that we are all striving to deliver. President Nosser, as a boy, my fascination was a total preoccupation with birds, and in particular birds of prey, with my favourite being the peregrine falcon. So I have to say, I was deeply miffed when Bob Doris was made the wildlife champion. The spring bun from Glasgow, MSP, I have to say, was made the wildlife champion for the peregrine falcon. I questioned the validity of Bob Doris. OK. John Mason. Would the member accept that we do have birds of prey in Glasgow and we look after them very well? Jim Fairley. <laughs> you should have waited, John. <laughs> I question the validity of bold Bob Doris getting in before to pinch my peregrine falcon from out in front of me because, after all, Bob is a city boy and I'm a chukta. So surely it's only right that the country loon gets the majestic peregrine falcon to champion. But as I sat in my office here in the Parliament looking out of the window for inspiration, I was more than a bit surprised to witness a peregrine falcon flying over the buildings of our capital, our city, and had to concede that Bob, the city boy, was absolutely entitled to his peregrine when they were now in such rude health as to be hunting the city pigeons over our capital city. Mind you, I got the most account, iconic of moorland birds, the curlew, so I'm delighted to be that champion and all ground nesters, which protecting is what this bill is all about. <coughs> <clears throat> I may have made light in this contribution of some of the serious issues we really need to tackle and we seek to do in this bill, but I am determined to work with all the stakeholders as we progress the bill through stage two at committee to try and find the right compromises <clears throat> in the same way as we did with the Hunting with Dogs bill so that we continue to represent our rural constituencies and tackle the issues. I certainly will give way, yeah. Stephen Kerr. Moving way. He's talking about compromises. He hasn't quite addressed the, some of the other issues in this bill. Which areas is he looking for the government to make some compromises? Tim Fairley. There are numerous areas that are going to be decided through compromise, through conversation and through quiet negotiation with the stakeholders at hand. So there's many of them to be getting through. However, we've had Finlay Carson, Rachel Hamilton and Oliver Mundell all say that the licensing scheme for hunting with dogs has been a disaster. Well, I can tell you, the first licence has already been granted for hunting with dogs. It's happening here today, 
and the, the Athel and Bredalbin have got their licence. So Nature Scott are working with the practitioners to make sure that they can make this work. However, President Officer, I cannot mention the Peregrine Falcon through all of my iterations today without passing comment on the perpetrators of the absolutely heinous crime committed in the Pentlands this week, where an illegally set pole trap was used to catch and kill one of these magnificent birds. And I do not have the words in me to express my disgust at the perpetrators and hope that in the fullness of time they are caught and the full force of the law is brought to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Stephen Kerr in six minutes. Ms Burgess. Thank you. Earlier this month, I had the pleasure of attending the Revive Coalition's National Conference. The event brought together a great number and wide variety of people, many living and working in rural Scotland, to ask us to consider what land management practices best serve the needs of Scotland's people and natural world in this century, and what changes can help us in the face of the nature and climate crises. Those are the very questions that the committee have been grappling with as we considered the core aspects of this bill. And I wish to thank my fellow committee members, the witnesses and stakeholders, and the parliament clerks who have supported us during stage one. I want to be clear at the outset that I and the Scottish Green Party fully support the measures in this bill. And for context, so too do the majority of people in Scotland. Polling from Revive shows that the majority of Scots oppose the use of wildlife traps and Muirburn for the purpose of increasing grouse numbers, and that six in 10 are opposed to grouse shooting. Events just this week, as have been mentioned, further underline how vital this legislation is. On Monday, Police Scotland announced that a young golden eagle, one of the success stories from the South of Scotland translocation program, has been missing since the 18th of October, when it was last located in the Scottish borders. And the police statement says that, quote, officers believe the bird has come to harm and are treating its disappearance as suspicious. Barely 24 hours later, another police appeal was issued about the peregrine falcon that Jim Fairley mentions, found dead in an illegally set pole trap just outside of Edinburgh. Presiding officer, our protected birds of prey are not safe under the current law. RSPB's latest bird crime report found that in 2022, at least 64% of the total incidents of raptor persecution across the UK were linked to land managed for pheasant, partridge and grouse shooting. That is the same evidential link that led the Scottish Government to consider legislative options back in the last Parliament. The grouse moor licensing provisions in this bill will set basic requirements for sporting businesses to comply with, guided by co uh, a co-produced code of practice. And this will ensure that the majority of businesses that currently follow the law can continue to operate above suspicion while raising the bar on those who persist in undertaking illegal management practices. I am particularly pleased that the government has committed to bringing forward additional provisions at stage two to extend the Scottish SPCA's powers and to fully ban snares. While the committee as a whole could not reach a consensus view on the snare proposal, I am convinced by the overwhelming evidence we heard from the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission and others that the very real harm caused by snares, whether of a traditional or more recent design, cannot be mitigated. This ban is warranted on the weight of the animal welfare impact alone. An animal caught in a snare is injured, highly stressed, exposed to the elements and other predators, denied food and water. And of course, snares are completely indiscriminate. A fox can be trapped, but so too have unintended species, including otters and even pets, as we heard already from my colleague Karen Adams. Conservation organisations spoke of the alternative approaches they employ to protect important bird species from predation. A ban on snares is a mark of the high regard this country has for its iconic wildlife. On the Minister's plans to extend the Scottish SPCA powers, again, I am in full support. We heard in evidence on several occasions of scenarios where the SSPCA officer called to attend an injured animal caught in an illegally set trap cannot in investigate or seize appropriate evidence 
of illegal activity because the animal has died by the time they arrive. Their current powers don't cover that sort of situation, but the proposed extension of powers would allow evidence of wildlife crime in such circumstances to be gathered by inspectors. This change expands our ability to bring more of those perpetuating wildlife crimes to justice and protect the reputations of those businesses that do abide by the law. Turning to other aspects of the bill in my remaining time, I agree with the proposals to require those setting wildlife traps to... Could you resume your seat a second, uh, Ms. Burgess? Mr. Mountain. That, is, that falls well outside the courtesy and respect um, requirements that are on all members throughout the course of their business in the, in the Chamber. Edward Mountain. I apologise profusely if I've overset the mark. Uh, I would like to uh, lodge, I would like an intervention. Thank, thank Ariane Burgess. In the way that I've done, I'm going to continue, and also because I'm concerned about time. Turning to the other aspects of the bill, in my remaining time, I agree with the proposals to require those setting wildlife traps to register with Nature Scott, undergo training, and display identification numbers on their traps. Last but no, by no means least, the provision on licensing Muraburn takes us a step further in responding to the climate emergency by protecting Scotland's peatlands and their vital role of locking up carbon emissions. We have heard debate about the extent of peatlands that should be included in the licence schemes, that with, a depth of 50, that with a depth of 50, 40 or 30 centimetres, yet there are many scientists who recognise that all peat is peat and that all of it merits protection. The proposal before us strike a balance of limiting what muir burn occurs and, while, and when, while allowing the government to gather better data on why muir burn is practiced, by whom and by where. Yes, I'll take an intervention from Finley, Finley Carson. Thank you for, for giving way. Can you tell me uh, where we heard any evidence of peat being damaged uh, under controlled muir burn conditions? Through the chair and Ariane Burgess, I can give the time back for the intervention. Thank, thank, you, very, thank you very much for that. Um, I, as I said, I think from my perspective, peat is peat, and actually we should be considering seriously whether we're burning anywhere. I will be seeking further discussion with the Minister at Stage 2 on the proposed dates for the Muribian burn season to ensure that burning activity does not interfere with the nesting bird season, which is occurring earlier each year due to climate change. To conclude, presiding officer, this parliament must legislate for the Scotland of the future, a future that will see us grappling with the consequences of climate and nature crises. This bill gives government the tools needed to better protect Scotland's wildlife, ensure peatlands are restored, and that our uplands are fit for the future. And I am pleased to support the principles of this bill. Thank you. I now call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Alistair Allen in around six minutes. Mr Kerr. Uh, President, officer, uh, I am Burgess is quite wrong. We legislate for the Scotland of the present. We have to deal with the present realities, and that's something that the uh, members who are proposing and supporting this particular bill don't seem to have a grasp of. I would love to have heard uh, from Karen Adam what the British Pest Control Association said was a better way of controlling the rat population that is exponentially increasing in our cities, particularly in hospitals and other sensitive areas. Uh, the intervention was offered that she would say so, but she didn't tell us what those, those would be. Um, I would. I'd be delighted to hear what those Karen, are. Karen Adam. Thank you. Um, the, the member says there that I didn't say what would be a better solution. Perhaps there are alternatives, and we know there are alternatives, but perhaps it's because we are consistently using the glue traps and not the alternatives that we can't get a better bearing on that. Stephen Kerr. The record will show that uh, Karen Adam said that, there, that she had met with the British Pest Control Association outside of committee, and they had told her there were better methods, even if they were slightly more expensive. So that suggested something very specific had been shared with Karen, Karen Adam, and I think it's something that should be shared with the whole chamber. Um, I also thought, and I really always enjoy listening to Kate Forbes, I have to say that she's an excellent speaker in this chamber, whatever position she takes, but she gave a very political speech. 
saying very little about the areas of the bill that I'm sure in her heart of hearts she knows are absolutely not what rural Scotland wants to hear. And likewise, Jim Fairley. Jim Fairley gave another very clever speech for Jim Fairley, especially a wonderfully clever speech, saying absolutely nothing about the things that are in this bill that he will know the people in his constituency who work the land do not want. And I'll always give way to Kate Forbes. Kate Forbes. Very good, because I appreciate I didn't let him intervene on me, so thank you so much. Um, what I was trying to say in my remarks, and I'll maybe just say it again, is that I think that the licensing scheme cannot be onerous. If it is onerous and overly bureaucratic, then we may not end up with the muir burn that we need. So there is an actual example of an area I would like to see some compromise on. Stephen Kerr. Welcome, but of course there are many other things in this bill, and of course I'll give way to Jim Fairley, because I mentioned him and he's entitled to have his say. Jim Fairley. Thank you very much to Mr Kerr for taking the intervention. I think the point of the speech that I made today was supporting the general principles of the bill, but talking about the fact that there's going to be an awful lot of negotiation gets done, there are areas of this bill that will have to be looked at, but it will be done quietly, it will be done properly, and it will be done in a way without the booyah politics that seems to be wanting to be going on in here. Stephen Kerr. Well, Jim Fairley is in favour of the principles of the bill, but then he says a lot of it will need to be changed. Therefore, I would suggest that if that's the case, you can't be in favour of the principles of the bill. You have to vote against the bill. But I'm sure that's not going to happen, because I've been around here for long enough to know that's not how the SNP work. Audrey Nick. For giving way. I mean, I've been listening with interest. I'm not on the committee, and I've been listening with great interest uh, to the debate this afternoon. One thing I picked up from the report was the tension between expert knowledge of scientists and local knowledge held by practitioners in the field. So, in my view, the comments that Jim Fairley made were absolutely appropriate, and that there has to be discussion and there has to be um, consideration given by all sides. Stephen Kerr. Of course there does. But if you, then, if you say you're in favour of the principle of the bill and then you say, well, there's going to have a lot of compromising and a lot of discussion, a lot of it, because a lot of this bill is not what is needed by rural Scotland. And the members opposite who represent rural constituencies know that very well. And I'm not sure I'm going to be allowed to take many more interventions I, I, as I'm much as I love... I'm not going to be able to give you back good... all the time, Mr Kerr, so... I, as much as I love a good and proper debate, which sometimes we occasionally have in this chamber, and the fact is that this bill uh, shows writ large the blinkered and dogmatic thinking of this green-led SNP government, because that's what it is. And what it reveals is a government that is unwilling to listen. We heard the story about how stakeholders came to my uh, friend's committee Conveners Committee, Rural Affairs, gave their evidence tw less than 24 hours later. Without that evidence ever being considered, everything was overturned. And, 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 and I'd love to, can I? I'd love to. Can I? It's up to you, Mr Kerr. I can give you well, some of the time back. Well, uh, some of the time's fine. Minister. Mr Kerr would be forgiven for not realising, because he's not on the committee, that the committee asked me to make a decision on snaring uh, when I gave evidence uh, the week before, and I committed to give them that decision, which happened the day after, I think, the evidence was given on, on snaring from the stakeholders. So it was the committee that asked for that. Stephen Kerr. I was, I was advised that the minister would say exactly that. The reality is that there were many other issues that the Minister was asked to come back to the committee and didn't abide by their timetable, so she could easily have said to the convener, who's one of the most reasonable people in this Parliament, by the way, that, uh, that, 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 that she wanted more time to consider uh, the evidence, the evidence that had been presented uh, the, the, the day before in, in that committee. But this is a government... Minister. This is a government driven less by pragmatism, in fact, not at all by pragmatism, and completely driven by ideology. And it shows itself again today as caring nothing for the views of people who live and work in rural Scotland. And uh, the members opposite, I think, know that in their heart of hearts. This is a government that is in thrall now uh, to, to this ideology, and is dangerous. Now, Muirburn is an essential part of managing the countryside. Um, and, but with the SNP Green government's proposals, which aim to protect Scotland's peatlands, it's a perfect showcase of how prioritising optics over expertise leads to dangerous legislation. Now, 
the idea that somebody in Edinburgh knows better than people who have been stewards of our land for generations is actually downright offensive. Curiosity and rigorous fact-finding before making decisions used to be a prerequisite for entering public service. But this SNP Green government is different. They actually will sit on any backbencher who dares to ask difficult questions, who dares to be curious, but instead rewards blind loyalty. Yeah. If members on the government benches continue to refuse to heed the warnings and insights of those who truly understand the matters that are before this Parliament in this bill, all of Scotland will suffer the consequences. Because this bill, like many others pushed by this SNP Green Government, falls shockingly short in substance and at the same time overreaches itself. In fact, it significantly elevates the risk of wildfires, a point made by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, who have warned that restricting Muirborne locations could leave a larger fuel load unmanaged, heightening the risk of devastating wildfires that could harm peatlands. Now, I have taken a lot of interventions and I know that the presiding officer has been very generous with me. There are many other things I'd like to have mentioned. I'd like to have mentioned licensing. I would like to have mentioned the idea that um, we need to extend the powers of the SSPCA, which I do not support. There are many other issues. And, but the bottom line of my appeal to members on this side, in, in, when we come to decision time, presiding officer, is that they vote according to what they know is right by their constituencies and not what they have been told by a chief whip. Thank you. I now call uh, Alistair Allen, uh, around six minutes, Mr. Uh, Dr. Allen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this, as others have pointed out, is a bill that deals with very disparate subjects, but its title attempts to deal with that fact honestly. Uh, and no bill like this, of course, will ever please every interest group, but it does, in this case, uh, do what it says on the legislative tin. More importantly, Presiding Officer, it is a genuine attempt to address several real concerns around animal welfare and biodiversity, while balancing those needs against the genuine interests of those who work in the countryside, in pest control and in other, interests, other areas of the economy. With that in mind, as a member of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee, I am happy to support the general principles of the Bill and to recommend it to Parliament for further consideration. And incidentally, there isn't a contradiction between supporting the general principles of a bill and recommending it for further consideration. So can I mention my own thanks to other members of the committee, to the committee clerks, and to the many individuals and organisations who have provided us with evidence, both in person and in writing. Collectively, they have allowed the committee to produce the stage one report, which we are debating today. I am not going to get round every aspect of the Bill in the time available, but a substantial part of the Bill's scope uh, deals with uh, wildlife crime and, in particular, with the issue of raptor persecution, as the Minister mentioned. Now, raptor persecution is, by its very nature, a crime largely committed without human witnesses, and we received significant evidence that, as a consequence of that fact, the criminal standard of evidence that currently applies around raptor persecution cases is proving hard, indeed perhaps virtually impossible to meet. This is true even in situations where significant concerns exist about the activities on a particular land holding. Now, in contrast with the rather fevered contribution we heard from Mr Mundell, in RSPB Scotland's evidence they pointed to uh, an overwhelming weight of peer-reviewed science, innumerable police investigations and a considerable amount of witness evidence proving that crimes against raptors are inextricably linked to grouse moor management. They highlighted a May 2023 study which analysed data from over 140 satellite-tagged hen harriers which revealed very low, in their words, very low survival rates and shows that mortality hazards due to illegal killing were higher for birds using upland areas managed for grouse shooting. Now, the committee heard significant evidence that while the vast majority of land managers, including, I should say, the vast majority of grouse moors, uh, while they are working within the law, a licence scheme around grouse moor estates is a proportionate response to ensure that raptor persecution, where it happens, is being tackled. Now, I'm not going to speak, as I say, about uh, everything in the bill uh, in the time available. Others, I'm sure, will, will speak about snaring and other issues. 
However, I would briefly mention something um, about Muirburn, one of the other major subjects of this bill. The committee heard evidence from a variety of sectors in this, including uh, relevant to my own area, crofting. The Scottish Crofting Federation raised uh, its uh, questions about how any new regulation would be designed and implemented with crofting in mind, as well as the states. Whatever system we use, presiding officer, clearly it will need clarity in terms of responsibility for applications for your burn on common grazings and how this might impact liability. So I'm sure we will return to these issues. On a completely different subject again, one of the more unlikely questions which the committee uh, has had to take evidence on in this bill concerns, as others have alluded to, the trapping of mice and rats and how welfare concerns can be reconciled with legitimate pest control practices, not least in the health and hospitality sectors. It is undeniable that glue traps pose significant animal welfare concerns. Their indiscriminate nature means that, as well as rodents, unintended targets such as small birds or other animals can also be trapped. And the committee also heard evidence of the inappropriate use of these traps by members of the public. There is a general agreement that these traps should not be available for the general public to purchase. The committee also heard, however, from the pest control industry about their preference for a licensing scheme to permit the continued use of glue traps in high-risk settings, as others have alluded to, uh, where um, it, it may be difficult to find alternative solutions. And while the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission told the committee that a couple more years should bring better solutions for these settings, they have recommended a fallback option for a fixed term, meaning a maximum of three years, of very strict licensing schemes for pest controllers while those alternatives are being investigated. This is, incidentally, one area of the bill where it will be interesting to see whether the UK Internal Market Act will impose constraints on the ability of this Parliament's legislation to have practical effect. And I appreciate, Presiding Officer, I've made this point before, but it is somewhat incredible that this place, which some members have disputatiously claimed to be the most evolved Parliament in the world, should require the blessing of the UK Government before it can effectively change the law on rat traps. Yeah. But there you go. As the report indicates, there are questions to which Parliament will have to return with further scrutiny and debate. That is what happens in, in uh, stage two of legislation, for those who don't seem to understand that. However, I am very happy to support the general principles of this bill and to recommend it to Parliament's further consideration. Thank you, Dr Allen. We now move to the closing speeches. Just to advise the Chamber what time we had um, in hand has now been pretty much exhausted, so I'm going to have to require members to stick to their time allocations. I call first Sarah Boyack, uh, up to six minutes. Ms Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I first of all want to thank everyone on the committee, the clerks and all those who gave evidence on the Wildlife Management and Muirburn Bill, because it's clearly a set of legislative proposals that have generated responses with a wide range of views. And it's also clear reading the committee report that there's still much more needing to be done in the topics addressed by the bill. And essentially this bill is unfinished and the committee and the Parliament is going to have to do a lot more work to make sure it delivers on the ambitions set out by the Minister in her opening remarks. But I think also it's rare for me to see not just the detailed submissions from such a raft of stakeholders, but for the Committee's recommendation to identify the range of areas where more work needs to be done before the Bill is finalised. And I think uh, today has been very useful in highlighting um, those debates. I think for me the principle of humane wildlife control and land management that enables rural businesses to be successful while at the same time supporting biodiversity is vital. But we also need to join up some of the other debates we're having in this chamber and address the challenge posed by climate change and extreme weather. So that means a more joined up approach in policy terms but also in action to ensure that the manage of our, management of our land is sustainable going forward, whether it's dealing with increased incidents of flooding or the impacts of droughts leading to more and more fires across land when it dries out or is degraded. So I think the comments by Kate Forbes were actually quite important highlighting the impact of that. And for me, what I take away is that we need to involve and support land managers to manage moorlands and peatlands, because that's critical if we're going to support rural jobs and livelihoods, but it's also important for the safety and the long-standing uh, contribution that we, we can make in terms of climate change. 
There's also a key issue here, I think, in terms of resources, which I'm going to come back to. Um, I think in relation to the key aspects of the bill, um, Scottish Labour very much supports the principles in terms of humane wildlife control and biodiversity, the um, proposals to ban glue traps, tackling raptor persecution and banning traditional snares. And I think the evidence that the committee got from animal welfare groups and nature conservation organisations have actually been powerful evidence on the need for legislation. But I thought the points made by Alistair Allen about the peer reviewed evidence highlighted by RSPB was important. And I think there's a key issue here about looking at the evidence and having more evidence carried out as this legislation is implemented and as the licensing regimes are developed and, and implemented, because we need a lot more work done to make these ambitions successful. And I think that goes back to the point I made about a joined up approach to work with land managers, farmers, to ensure the implementation of the bill will work. And if you look at the recommendations from the Grouseware Management Group and the research by the National Wildlife Crime Rule at RSPB Scotland, that all needs to feed into this legislation so that you've got a pragmatic approach to the licensing that's being suggested and, a, and to make sure that that is managed as it's introduced. One of the things I think is clear from looking at the evidence is there's a major challenge in terms of resourcing its implementation. Our police are already under huge financial pressures, so it's important that there are new, resor new the resources for new obligations that follow from this bill, whether it's the police or Nature Scott. And one issue to pick up, while we can see merit to giving additional powers of investigation to SSPCA officers, Scottish Labour, we believe, having looked at the evidence, the police have to retain the primacy over wildlife crime investigations and there were concerns raised by legal stakeholders which need to be addressed. So that again needs more investment in additional training, with protocols being developed that are transparent and don't undermine our criminal justice system. Um, there's been quite a few discussions this afternoon about the licensing schemes being proposed. They need to be implemented successfully and it's important they don't create unintended consequences. So again, we need to see them designed effectively. Uh, if it's a brief comment, yes. Rachel As the bill stands, Nature Scott require nothing more than an accusation of crime to suspend a licence and that will affect jobs and livelihoods. Um, does the member agree um, that it could also contravene um, Article 6 of the ECHR? I think we need to look at the evidence that there, are, there is clear evidence of wrongdoing out there and it needs to be challenged. So standards need to be raised, but it needs to be proper and effective enforcement. So the points made about licensing in terms of not doing annual licensing rounds, but making it longer, those are the kind of details that I think came out in the committee evidence that's important. So I think there's a lot of work to be done by the Scottish Government to ensure by the time we get this bill through stage through, into stage three, that it has been effectively amended so that it will cover the areas of uncertainty highlighted by the committee. And I think the points made by Rhoda Grant in relation to Muirburn also need to be considered um, because we need that new regime to be effective. It needs a joined up approach from stakeholders, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, land managers, Nature Scott, because we critically need well-managed moorlands and peatlands that don't just support biodiversity, but they also support rural jobs. And that is the dialogue that's been in the Chamber today. That needs to keep going into the committee. It does not mean we'll get unanimous agreement on this bill, but we need to use stage two to improve the legislation so that we have monitoring, that we have reviewing of the licensing regimes. There's a commitment from ministers on that to ensure that those regimes are proportionate and to address the points made by Colin Smith that these are really important because they will actually make a difference in our communities. They'll improve biodiversity, they'll improve wildlife, they'll stop the abuse of wildlife we're currently seeing, and critically that those implementing those new regimes have the staff and the resources to make them effective. So Scottish Labour will support this legislation this afternoon, but we have been listening to the comments made by a range of stakeholders who support conclude. the ambitions but in crafting amendments and thinking through how it will be implemented, we need to listen to the evidence that's been given to the committee and that's been discussed and flagged up in this chamber today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Boyack. I now call Edward Mountain uh, up to seven minutes, please, Mr Thank Mountain. you very much, Presiding Officer. And I re reiterate my apology for my intemperate amendment to Ariane Burgess and would, of course, be prepared to give way to her if she wants to interrupt or make, take a, make an intervention during my speech. <laughs> Presiding Officer, I will declare I have no registered interest in moorland and Muirburn aspects of this bill. 
However, I do want to make it clear that I have an interest in what this bill aims to do, especially in relation to trapping. For many years, presiding officer, probably over 40, I have been involved in upland management. I have learned that achieving a balance is what is best for the environment. No one wants a desert, and this is often the consequence of over or indeed under management. Presiding officer, I will admit to getting blood on my hands, controlling and fighting moorland fires, from culling deer, from creating habitats and defending them, and from protecting lambs and ground nesting birds from predation. I have got dirt under my fingernails, and I have been covered in soot, and I'm proud of what I've done, and I'm proud of what I've achieved, and I'm proud of what I've achieved and led others to do. Some of this may seem unacceptable to those who seek to make changes in the way that we manage our countryside, but those are the people who have often become instant experts by reading biased briefings. Their hands are dirty from the ink on the paper of those briefings, and the blood they have shed are from the paper cuts from turning the pages, not from working the countryside. They have never spent freezing nights out in cold, wet nights, waiting for foxes that steal their lambs, or spent days fighting fires. That is why those people in the countryside feel ignored and marginalised. Let me be clear, managing wildlife is gruelling hard work and requires a balance between giving life and ending life. Those in the countryside know that and accept it. And I stand here somewhat disappointed in the arguments that I have heard during the evidence session, which have often been ill-informed and based on arguments put forward by single-issue pressure groups who do not promote balance. Now, turning to the points that have been raised in the debate this afternoon on Grasmore licensing, I don't believe the Minister is right that Grasmore licensing will prevent illegal raptor persecution. I believe illegal raptor persecution is a scourge, and I've always said that. But I don't think licensing will be, make a difference. But I believe that because of the way this bill is being forced through, it will come. But I believe that the Minister is going to make this law Sorry, I guess I will take an intervention. Kate Forbes. Forbes. Uh, thank you to the member. I mean this in, in, in all sincerity. What would he suggest might end raptor persecution in terms of uh, the government considering what could be done further? Edward Mayne. Well, a huge amount has been done and on raptor persecution, which I will cover separately, the fact that there were only six incidents last year shows the huge decline that there should be. Yeah. But there should be increased fines, in my opinion. There should be increased policing. Going back to the point on Grasmore licensing, I do believe the Minister needs to consider making the terms of a licence or the length of a licence much longer. I think that five years is the minimum amount of period. A huge amount of investment is required in the countryside. And I personally don't like Nature Scott being the judge, jury and executioner. What I've seen of them in the past means that they are not always fair. And those that fall under their clutches and meet their disapproval often don't feel they've been treated fairly. Now, I would be, support, uh, be more convinced of supporting a form of licensing if I believed that Nature Scott were taken out of the equation. I don't believe that I can, though, because I don't believe they're an honest brochure, a broker. And just on the issue of... Uh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Rada, I, I completely misheard from where it came Good from. I'm just interested in what the member is saying. Who then should be in charge of the licensing regime of not nature, Scott? Edward Martin. Uh, and I thank the member for that intervention. What we do know is in the European courts that it is never considered a good thing to have one person being responsible for issuing the licence, for regulating the licence and for pro prosecuting those people that don't do it. So I think we need to find a new body. I don't know the answer. I would like to talk on rapt persecution, though. And I believe that we will hear, and many will have heard the RSPB saying that the six birds of death offences that were in 2023 were the tip of the iceberg. They perhaps were the tip of the iceberg and they were unacceptable. But let me be entirely clear from freedom of information requests that I've done on Nature Scott, I'm clear that in 2021, 11 birds of prey were chopped up by wind turbine and they were the tip of the iceberg. That included two golden eagles and a white-tailed sea eagle. That is unacceptable in the same way it is unacceptable that people persecute raptors. And Oliver Mundell was right when he brought that up. 
Now, when it comes to Muirburn, I'm probably one of the few people, and I'll take an intervention from anyone who wants to, t to make it, who've actually done a considerable amount of uh, Muirburn. There's 25 pages in the Muirburn Code. I think I know them pretty well. And it's a pretty good code. In fact, I've gone to arbitration over the Muirburn Code with Nature Scott and won the arbitration because they didn't understand it as well as I did. And I think if the Muirburn Code is abided by, then it is the right thing to do. There is no doubt in my mind that burning bits of heather, which is on short uh, peat, i.e. small peat, is probably the wrong thing to do because it's probably on the higher ground. Now, presiding officer, I am conscious that I'm running out of time, but I do just want to mention snaring before I go on. Uh, and that is the fact on snaring. What I haven't heard is a logical alternative. Let me be clear, placing live traps around the countryside does not really work. I believe that snaring does work, and if the snares are operated correctly and within the law, they should not cause suffering. Now, I hear Karen Adams' comment, and I'm deeply disturbed to know that that happened. My comment to you is that if it was a legal snare and had been operated within the guidance and the rules that people are trained to use, that could not have happened. So somebody must have done something wrong. When it comes to glue traps, I believe that the argument for banning glue traps is a bad one. I think the argument for banning it from public use is a good one. Therefore, I would like to see regulation to allow professionals to use it. I don't accept the government's point of view that you can't uh, challenge that professionally for the simple reason that you've done that on snaring. There are rules and you have to pass a course to be allowed to snare. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I cannot support this bill and neither could the committee, uh, but I know that it will be forced through by a majority of urban MSPs. MSPs with the best intention that have never faced some of the issues that we are discussing. Muirburn is a vital tool in our armoury in preventing wildfires. And there ain't much heather around Edinburgh and Glasgow. Snaring might seem cruel, but is it, is it more cruel for a fox or a badger eating the rear end of a sheep that's in the process of lambing? Is chopping up birds of prey and turbines as unacceptable as poisoning or shooting them? I believe it is. Therefore, presiding officer, I cannot support this bill because I don't believe it supports the countryside and the environment we should be supporting in this parliament. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Martin. I now call on the minister to wind up the debate uh, up to eight minutes, minister. Thank you, presiding officer. As I close the debate, I want to thank all the stakeholders who have engaged with me and contributed to the development of the bill. And indeed, uh, obviously, they've given a lot of evidence uh, around this. I'd also like to thank the members who have spoken in the debate today. Um, they've been varied contributions. I've enjoyed some more than others, I have to say, uh, but I'll continue to reflect on all the points that have been made and, and, and uh, go through them if, if I could. The convener um, mentioned the, 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 in the glue traps uh, speed of things about the dispensation for pest controllers uh, around using uh, glue traps. However, this is inherently problematic, as I, and I have looked into this, because there's no actual accreditation. Um, but other, I have to point out to the other countries that have banned glue traps. Obviously, we heard that Wales have, have, have just recently uh, put that in place, but other countries have had them banned for years. And I point to New Zealand, who actually did have some kind of licensing scheme in place, but have never actually awarded any of the licenses for doing it, because it's just, as, as somebody put in a report, there was a report uh, written by pest controllers saying that they, they have moved on from them. They just haven't really been, been something that they, they have missed. Um, also, he mentioned uh, suspension of licences over vexatious complaints, and, and I'm, I'm going to consider, and I have said to the committee, the wording around this in the bill and if clarity is needed on what an official investigation would mean. Um, but it is not true to say, as Rachel Hamilton did, that um, basically the, 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 a, li a licence will be suspended on the basis of an accusation. That is not true in any sphere of law at all. You need evidence, you need an investigation, so that's not true. I think that that kind of rhetoric around that is deeply worrying for people, I will, because I have mentioned her. Rachel Hamilton. There are two standards of proof in Scotland, and they are uh, the civil and criminal burden of proof. And this bill introduces a power to punish without proof, and that is categorically correct. Minister. 
No, I, I, I disagree with that point whole, wholeheartedly. Um, Nature Scott will look at every case on its own merit, uh, working closely with Police Scotland and reacting in step with the seriousness of the potential licence conditions that have been broken. Um, so I, just, I, I, I just want to, to move on to talking about some of the, the, the other contributions. And Rachel Hamilton mentioned uh, about the committee taking a, 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 um, the committee's evidence that they took, but she did not, and in my intervention to her, she did not recognise it, but she had, they had the, the privilege of having Professor, Professor Wellity's team talk about the benefits of a licensing scheme. And I also think that Alistair Allen's intervention was spot on. No one is saying that all grouse moors are host to illegal activities. Far from it. And I hope I have made it clear that I know that there are states in Scotland who are doing a great deal of excellent work in improving biodiversity. And I have said on many occasions about the contributions that they give to rural life in Scotland, to tourism and to local economies. Um, she mentioned about human rights um, implications. Here, ECHR uh, implications have been carefully considered and informed by a, near to, uh, a need to strike a balance between the rights of individuals and the general public uh, interest as always is. But I would also point out the presiding officer has also ruled that the bill is ECHR compliant. Um, I, I, want to, I want to move on to talk to Rhoda Grant. I was pleased to hear of Labour's support of, of, of the bill. Um, but I was also, I, you'll have seen that I raised a smile when Claudia Beamish was, was mentioned. I genuinely wish that Claudia were in the chamber today with us because she has long been a passionate campaigner for uh, the measures that this bill undertakes. And I, I wish her well. I, I would say that um, I think Claudia would be one of, one of the, the friends of mine from the last uh, p uh, parliament, and we work together very well on the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform uh, uh, um, uh, Committee. Um, in, in, in terms of what Rhoda Grant says about following the, sci the science around Muirburn and the Muirburn season in particular, I am following the science on that. It's something that I'm actively considering. It was brought up by Ariane Burgess as well around the sort of like timing of the Muirburn season because, of course, things around climate change mean, means that, 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 that that season could be changing about when birds are actually uh, nesting. So that is something that I'm actively looking at. Beatrice Rusher mentioned licensing schemes being proportionate and workable. I have taken on board very much so uh, the suggestion of a longer licensing duration and of course the duration of the suspension of licensing will depend on the decision about where we come to in, uh, with regard to the license duration and a range of other factors um, around duration of investigations and I'll work closely with Nature Scott and the Police Wildlife uh, Crime Units on that. On glue trap alternatives, I absolutely hear that there is flexibility into the commencement on this. There's nothing that says that there's actually no date and there's no duration actually specified on the bill around that. Um, but I, of course, I would draw Ms. Ms. Wishart's attention to what's happened in New Zealand as well, as I've already mentioned. Um, Karen Adam talked about the sustainability of grouse shooting and its positive contribution to the natural environment when they are managed well. I absolutely agree with her. But it goes back to my point that I believe that licensing will be a good thing for the whole sector. Um, and, and also, I just want to mention... Yes, I will. Finley Carson. Thank, thank, uh, thank the Minister for giving away. One crucial element that we really want to hear is, will you give serious consideration to bringing in proper legal safeguards against vexatious or third-party claims, which could result in a licence being suspended uh, and, and, and the job losses and the income losses that that might uh, occur on the back of? Minister. Well, Mr Carson will refer him to the, my earlier comments when I was actually in front of the committee around this. So this is something that is going to be taken into consideration when the licensing scheme is developed with Nature Scott working with, with, with Police Scotland uh, Wildlife Crime Unit uh, uh, as well on that. I mean, vexatious allegations happen in every area of justice every single area. It's for the police to determine whether or not something is without foundation and vexation. I need to move on, convener. Um, I just want to mention, Karen Adam um, uh, also mentioned about the, the, uh, the unintended species that um, snares can, can catch. It's not just I mean, cats, it's a horrible situation that our cat was put in and, and I've, I, my, my, my parents have had experience of that as well with their, their cats. But it's also other protected species 
that are at caught in, in these traps as well, including uh, badgers, which has been mentioned very much in the written evidence that has come forward. I don't really want to dwell too much on Oliver Mandel's uh, contribution, not least because I felt it was really personally attacking in a way that I just found unpalatable, actually, for a parliamentarian. I reject his comments about Central Belt. I'm not from the Central Belt. I'm a rural MSP. Um, and I, given stakeholders time to put forward a proposal um, on, on human humane cable restraints. And I want to say on the record again that ample time was given for those who wanted to propose a, a, a licensing scheme on humane cable restraints. But unfortunately, when it came in front of me, I did not feel that it answered significant questions around what they were actually proposing would be the conditions of that licensing scheme. And it just did not meet the standard that I would expect in terms of, 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 of what, what some of the, the, the arguments around the, the banning of, the, of them were. But I have to say as well, this, this, uh, this argument about me not having, not having listened to evidence, not have, making a snap decision on that, my goodness. Can you not do better than that? For goodness sakes, I had uh, humane cable restraints talk to me, but the, the moment that I took the environment portfolio on, I have listened to all the evidence, I have looked at all the evidence, and I have met with stakeholders about this over a period of months. Kate Forbes rightly mentioned wildfires, and I, again, in her question yesterday to, to, the, yesterday to me about this in uh, portfolio questions or the day before, um, she mentioned those game ke uh, keepers that stopped the fires at Cannes. Um, I mentioned in response to, to Kate Forbes that, of course, when you're dealing with an emergency situation like that, you would not have to have a licence for Muirburn in order to, have the, uh, to put those fire breaks in place as well um, for those emergencies. Colin Smith, I want to mention, um, I'm really glad that Colin Smith spoke today uh, because his interest in this area is very long standing. And uh, he said that. Um, he said what a lot of people have said to me in this area is like licensing should not propose, should not worry anyone who's law abiding. Um, they have nothing to fear. I think he said businesses have nothing to fear. And I do remember his members' debate on snares uh, back in 2017. You do need um, to conclude, he, Minister. Yeah, he criticised the government for hesitating, but I hope so he understands why we needed to take the robust evidence. But who do you believe? Mr Mondell, who says that I, I made a snap decision on this, or Colin Smith, uh, who says that we're dilly-dallying on it. I will, I will wind up now. I just want to thank everyone to come, uh, for their contributions, and sorry to those that I haven't had time to mention. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. That concludes the debate on the point of order. Rachel Hamilton. Um, the Minister, I'm afraid, is being disingenuous regarding her consideration of the evidence that was given on humane cable restraints. On the 8th of November and the 9th of November, the Freedom of Information request specifically states that she did not consider that evidence, and that is what my colleague uh, Oliver Mundell stated in his contribution today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. It's not a point of order. It's now on the record. Uh, that concludes uh, the debate on wildlife management in Muirburn, Scotland Bill at stage one. It is time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of motion 11498 in the name of Gillian Martin on a financial resolution for the wildlife management in Muirburn, Scotland Bill. And I invite uh, the Minister to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. The question on the motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come, and there are two questions as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 11496, in the name of Gillian Martin, on wildlife management in Muirburn, Scotland Bill, at stage one, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Um, there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting platform.